morning. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here for another of the Nixon Legacy Forums that we co-sponsor with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Welcome to those of you who are attending in person here at the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C., and also those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. And a special welcome to our C-SPAN viewers this morning. We started doing these in 2010 and have now put on over three dozen such programs which feature in-depth discussions of various public policy initi initiatives undertaken by the Nixon administration. Documents concerning these initiatives are housed in the archives kept at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. What these programs add are the insights and explanations of the discussions and debates behind those documents by the very people who created them, which can provide unique insights into the policy development and implementation process utilized by President Nixon. What we are adding today is the ability to electronically retrieve relevant documents from the Nixon Library archives, which will be posted on our website at the same time as the video of today's presentation. We're most pleased to be working with the Nixon Foundation to make this combination of documents and their authors available to future researchers and scholars. Today's presentation is entitled, No Final Victories, Lessons from President Nixon's Drug Abuse Initiatives. And we're going to hear from several people from both the treatment and law enforcement sides who were involved in responses of the Nixon administration to the spread of heroin addiction in our inner cities in the late 1960s. The essence of the issue, heroin had been, had, has been a scourge to society ever since it was first developed as a treatment for morphine addiction by Bayer in 1898. Did Nixon administration initiatives really have heroin addiction on the run when we lost focus, or are opioids a continuing threat that can never be eliminated? Please let me introduce our moderator of today's forum, Jeff Shepard. Jeff joined the Nixon administration as a White House fellow in 1969, and then served for five years as president of Nixon's White House domestic council. Jeff. David, thank you. Good to be here. And welcome to all of you. Uh, as David said, uh, th this is probably our 38th uh, Nixon Legacy Forum. And it provides a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful partnership between National Archives and the Richard Nixon Foundation to help the, the uh, effort at future research by, uh, by presidential scholars into looking at what papers are at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, and by these programs to hearing from the people that help draft those papers. So you get uh, uh, the, the ability to actually get new insights into what happened. Our, our favorite analogy is to the Civil War. The archives has extensive records of what happened in the Civil War. But nobody sat down with, uh, with General Grant and said, well, why did you do this? Why, what, what, what was your thinking? And what we're able to do uh, uh, with, with support from the Nixon Foundation and from National Archives is to go behind the documents and talk about the whys and, and, and the wherefores of, of what we did. Uh, t today's program is on uh, uh, President Nixon's drug abuse initiatives. And uh, those of us that worked in that area believe that we made dramatic progress against a particular sort of heroin addiction, which was uh, 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 crippling the inner cities. And we're going to talk about how, how that came about and what we did and uh, uh, how that uh, uh, may have uh, been lost with, uh, with a focus when the focus moved on to, uh, to other things. So uh, what I'm going to do is sit and have our, uh, our panelists introduce themselves and tell you where they were when President Nixon was inaugurated and how they became involved in the drug abuse issue. And we'll start with Jeff Donfield. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> I graduated law school from Berkeley in 1968, uh, but during the summer of 1967, I was a clerk at the Nixon Law Firm in New York, and that's ultimately uh, what led to my uh, being hired at the White House. 
I joined the White House staff in 19, early 1969 and worked first for Bud Wilkinson, famous Oklahoma football coach. Uh, Bud had a vast portfolio of obligations, one of which was drug abuse. Uh, when I came to his staff, uh, he said, what would you like to do? And I felt that uh, drug abuse was an area in which, which I knew nothing about, but I felt that I could make a contribution to the well-being of America if I could figure out what the issues were and, and how it might be approached. It turned out that as a result of research, which I was able to do primarily by traveling around the country, including visiting uh, Dr. DuPont's program in Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. Benny Prim in, in uh, New York, Dr. Doles and Nicewander in New York, and primarily Dr. Jerome Jaffe in Chicago. Jerry was the head of the Illinois Drug Abuse Program. Uh, I visited therapeutic communities. I visited methadone maintenance communities. And the only folks in the treatment arena who had data on recidivism um, were the folks who uh, who were dealing with methadone. When I would ask the... Uh, Wait, you're getting way ahead of us. You're going to give our whole program away. I we're am. just introducing ourselves. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you. <laughs> Jeff and I are very, very good friends. He can't spell his name, but we're very good friends. Uh, he's the policy guy at the White House on drug treatment. And then we go to Bob DuPont. Bob, where were you when, when Nixon was elected, and how did you become involved in this? Well, my life changed when Richard Nixon was uh, inaugurated in a dramatic way. And let me go back before that, how I got to that point where my life changed so dramatically. Uh, I graduated from Emory College in Atlanta in 1958 and from Harvard Medical School uh, in 1963. I did my psychiatric training at Harvard and then came to NIH for uh, research training. And when I finished that uh, time at the age of 32, it was time for me to find my first job. Up until that time, I had been in, in training. And one day a week uh, during my residency, I'd worked at a state prison in Massachusetts, the Norfolk prison, which was distinguished as the place where Malcolm X served six years. And I really fell in love with the prisoners and the prisons as, a, as a, a career thought. And I thought, I really care about these people. I, I want to help them. I want to make a career in, in this area and find some way to use my medical knowledge to do something about that. So come uh, my time, I finished my training July 1st of 1968, which is a very important time for what we're talking about. Uh, I went to work for the District of Columbia Department of Corrections. Now to understand what's happened next, you have to understand that at the time, Washington, D.C. was a federal city. Uh, the mayor had just been appointed by Lyndon Johnson, uh, Walter Washington, and uh, the, the, the uh, city was run by the federal government, and the president was in charge uh, of what was going on here. So in that context, I am a lifelong Democrat. Uh, I was then, I am now. Uh, and when Richard Nixon was elected, I thought my life was coming to an end. I had lots of ideas for reforms in, in corrections, uh, mostly having to do with alternatives to incarceration and use of medical treatments. And I thought, well, this is over. And everybody expected Richard Nixon was going to not reappoint uh, uh, Walter Washington as the mayor. And when Nixon came in and reappointed Walter Washington, it changed the whole climate in the District of Columbia in terms of opening up possibilities. What I found was, once Nixon was there, was all of my reform ideas that I had in mind, which has languished under Lyndon Johnson, were suddenly interesting. And by May of 69, my first correctional reform programs were funded. Now, you can't imagine how fast the federal government moved under those circumstances. And that, that as I say, changed my life. What really changed we're the gonna stop you. We're going to stop you right All right, there. that's good. That gets you started. Life has changed. <laughs> we're very eager to tell our story. These are good, idealistic people, young people, coming to Washington. Uh, uh, and then we get to John Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. I'm very honored to be here today on this panel. Um, I graduated from college in New York. I owned a college in 1964. 
And a year later, I joined the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in New York. And my boss found out that I had taken some postgraduate courses in French literature. And that qualified me to work on the French Connection cases in New York at the time. And uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, in 1969, when an opening occurred in Paris for a narcotics attache, I applied and was selected. And uh, in uh, the fall of 1969, in September, I arrived in Paris. And I was in, uh, stationed in France for over three and a half years. Uh, and that's where I was the day when Great. President Nixon was See, John learned not, not to go on too long. <laughs> Otherwise, he tastes the whip. <clears throat> Normally, I just moderate, and, and I don't really get involved. But I was also involved in drug abuse uh, at the Nixon White House on the law enforcement side. Uh, uh, I, I joined the Domestic Council in 1970, <clears throat> and my public policy beat was uh, law and order, crime and drugs. But what you have here is, is four people, two of whom are young lawyers that are working on policy development and, and uh, effectuation, and two people who are career experts. Uh, Jeff and Bob are on the treatment side, John and I are on the law enforcement side, but we come from different aspects. So what we're gonna do is go through the development of President Nixon's attitudes and initiatives in drug abuse, and each, uh, each of these people is going to add as we go through uh, uh, because the, the development may be everything in the story of Nixon's drug abuse initiatives. So let me go to our first uh, uh, exhibit. Uh, and this is, these are all papers that you would find at the National Archives. This is from the 1968 campaign. And uh, uh, this was a booklet called Nixon on the Issues that was compiled by uh, Annalise and Marty Anderson, who did domestic affairs for President Nixon during the campaign. And what they were asked to do was, was demonstrate that Nixon had made substantive uh, statements about different policy initiatives. Uh, and, and what we were able to find was he, he did speak to the drug abuse issue and we've highlighted the first and the fourth statements only to show that from the very outset, Nixon is talking about drug abuse as a law enforcement issue, always first, but treatment is always there. He doesn't lead with treatment, but treatment is always a part of Nixon's approach to, to uh, uh, drug <clears throat> abuse. And just to remind you, in case you weren't around in 1968, President Nixon's campaign had two principal themes, uh, end the war with honor and restore law and order. And the drug abuse part comes in over the latter, but the lead was law enforcement. And then we go to President Nixon's special message to the Congress, and this is uh, July 14th. He's been president for six months, and he submits a message to the Congress divided into 10 principal areas where he wants initiatives and reforms. And if you're, if you're looking for the origins <clears throat> of what he wanted to do on drug abuse or what his staff was helping him to do on drug abuse, this is the key document. So we, will, we will keep going, but from the very outset, he's talking and including drug abuse as an important situation. And then we came across this memo from Daniel Moynihan. Uh, 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 Professor Moynihan was the original assistant to the president for urban affairs, and he dabbled in everything. I mean, Pat was an absolute delight. Uh, and we came across a memorandum that he wrote to John Mitchell, who was attorney general, and there's a highlighted part that says, you know, we could interdict the smuggling of heroin and make a huge difference. Jeff, you have some memory of that. Well, one of the uh, comments that Dr. Moynihan makes is that if we attack the problem, um, we can solve the heroin addiction problem in the United States between 12 and 24 months. That was... Just that disrupt the supply chain yeah, and go that, to the next that, problem. That would end it as we 
look back on history, that obviously was not a correct perception. But, but the idea of uh, uh, going and, and trying to disrupt the supply chain at its source, or the, uh, or the, the, uh, the French part, uh, is, is uh, not an irrational approach. It was just its timing. Well, it was two-pronged. Two I'll let John Coleman talk to this more specifically, but it was both Turkey, the source of the opium, and then France for the, um, the laboratories. And we should have John go into this. We, John had enough sense not to go into it in his introduction so he wouldn't get cut off. But this is, this is his moment because he was <laughs> heavily involved in the French connection. Now, what Dr. Moynihan uh, went to a number of BNDD offices throughout the uh, Middle East and Europe and visited Turkey and uh, saw firsthand the uh, growing of the opium poppies in Turkey uh, and then visited uh, France and talked with uh, the agents in the embassy as well as uh, some of the other embassy personnel um, about some of the diplomatic initiatives that might be undertaken. Uh, because at the time we're talking about now, 1969, 1970, 85% um, of the heroin available in the United States being consumed in the United States, 85% was made in laboratories, clandestine laboratories in southern France. Uh, and it was made from opium uh, produced in Turkey or morphine base, which is a refined form of uh, the opium. It's an in intermediary stage between opium and heroin. Um, but it has a one-to-one -one consistency with heroin, so it's easier to smuggle. Um, and and he, he realized the importance of controlling the international traffic if you're, going to, if you're going to stop the importation of heroin to the United States. And so I think that was key in his uh, recommendations to the Attorney General. Uh, Dr. Moynihan's recommendations were to increase our diplomatic efforts, increase our operations overseas, and increase the, uh, the global pressure on the producing nations, particularly Turkey, to this, uh, get out of the opium it, business. This wasn't a bolt out of the blue that, that nobody had thought of before. What's different is this is the assistant to the president exactly. saying to the new, newly installed attorney general, let's put some muscle behind this. Exactly. I, I think we'd benefit, John, from just describing for the audience the trek. Uh, poppies are grown in Turkey. Uh, the, the, they, they ooze gum. Right. The, the, you score the pod. The gum oozes out overnight. You scrape the gum off. Very labor intensive. And that becomes gum opium. And how does it get from there to France to right. where we are? Well, uh, about 10% of the raw materials in France uh, were, consisted of opium, raw opium. Uh, but that was very cheap because, as, as uh, Jeff said, it's, it, it was uh, produced by the opium pod, scraped off the pod at night or whatever, and uh, uh, solidified into some sort of a ball like uh, uh, half a kilo or a kilo package, and then um, uh, shipped off to France for the laboratories. But they found out early in the game that it would be a lot easier and they would make more money if they could convert it to morphine base. Uh, natural opium has, particularly Turkish opium or Persian opium, uh, has a morphine content of about 10%. But if you turn that into morphine base by a chemical process, <clears throat> the, the morphine base, the finished base, now has a morphine content sometimes exceeding 90%. And then when that's turned into heroin, the heroin will have a, a final percentage purity of between 90 and 95, sometimes reaching over 95%. And so uh, by being able to smuggle morphine base as opposed to opium, uh, there's a 10 to 1 volume ratio. So for every 10 kilos of opium, they could make one kilo of morphine base. So when they have heroin in south of France, how does it show up over here? Well, that's that, that was a very complex and difficult challenge for the BNDD at the time because we knew that French heroin was reaching New York because New York was the hub for the entire United States, uh, not just the East Coast, but as far west as uh, California uh, in some cases. And so uh, the mystery was how was the heroin getting from the laboratories in southern France into New York City where it would be controlled by the uh, mafia mostly 
uh, at the first uh, turnover from the French uh, uh, connections. And it turns out that there were a group of, there was a group of um, uh, French expatriates. These are French criminals, people wanted for crimes in France going back as far as the French Indochina War. Um, and, and some of these people were living in Brazil, in southern Brazil. And uh, uh, the Brazilian authorities uh, wanted them out of the country because they were creating problems in Brazil. And so the Brazilian authorities worked very closely with the United States, with the BNDD people. And they were deported to France, in one case deported to Italy, because he was Italian. But there were no direct flights between Brazil at the time and Europe, so they had to come through the United States. And when they came through the United States, they were captured. And uh, in most cases, rather than go back to France, where several of them were um, sentenced in absentia to uh, one was death, although the death penalty had been uh, canceled since he had been sentenced to death, they would basically be facing life in prison. Uh, rather than do that, they agreed to cooperate. And so they basically turned over everything they knew about the uh, investigations. And it turned out that they were the conduit, they were the link uh, between the sources in southern France and the Italian mafia groups in New York that were importing the heroin. And in the movie t called The French Connection, it's in the, the, the uh, uh, floor plates, right. door jams of a, a Jaguar, as I recall. Exactly. Uh, but it's, it's uh, uh, typical smuggling. It just happens to be heroin. It could have been diamonds. Exactly. And by the way, The French Connection movie was a wonderful movie um, uh, based on the book by Robin Moore. But it was actually a, a compilation of different vignettes from different cases. It wasn't, there wasn't a single French Connection case per se. Uh, and all of the vignettes in the production, in the movie, occurred, but they occurred in different cases. And yes, cars were very popular smuggling instruments from the uh, French because back in those days, we had a number of transatlantic uh, vessels between, uh, tra traveling between New York and Europe. Uh, there were Italian vessels, French, Swedish, um, Scandinavian, um, uh, uh, British, etc. And, and, and these vessels were ideal places to place things like personal cargo, automobiles. But the, the problem was, that even though we were able to, at times, get the drugs by seizing the automobiles, the people who accompanied them were what we called mules. They really didn't know very much about the organization other than they were hired to simply accompany a car. And so even if they cooperated, they were unable to tell us very much. And it wasn't until we got those people out of Brazil that we were able to put the pieces together in this puzzle and link up the Italian mafia uh, people in New York and, and with just, the French And just to remind our audience, you got started because you were in New York working for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and you started working on the French Connection cases, exactly. and you did such a good job, they sent you to France. Well, I, thank you very much for the compliment, but yeah, I, I, I had a, you know, a very good familiarity with the uh, cases, and, um, and, and, and that, that helped get to Super. France. Yeah. We'll, we'll go on. This is uh, President Nixon at a meeting in the cabinet room with the bipartisan congressional leadership, and they're talking about uh, drug abuse control and treatment issues. And again, this is in the first year of his, of his administration. So uh, he's sent the message to Congress, and then he invites the leadership up to the cabinet room to talk about the importance and the desire. And these, these people, in a, in a nice way, are being lobbied to uh, uh, pass legislation. It takes, it takes a little over a year and a half to actually get the legislation, but they're they're working very hard. Nixon's devoting personal time and attention to moving this along. Now, we were able to spot Bud Krogh in the back of the picture, right? Bud's in there. In the far right corner, uh, Bud's not able to be with us today, but Jeff and I both work for Bud, and in, in the minds of people who uh, look for the origins of the staffing of President Nixon, on the drug abuse issue, that, that, that's Bud's job. That's Bud's job, and we were mere helpers at the time. Correct. Talented, but mere <laughs> helpers. Now, this is an interesting shot, uh, because none of us are in the shot. This is uh, President Nixon saying hi to uh, uh, the President of France, welcoming him 
in the Rose Garden with uh, Secretary of State uh, Bill Rogers looking on. And John has a story about this. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, uh, meeting because at the time, there was a, a lot of growing pressure in the United States on, on France to uh, do something about the heroin traffic. Uh, there were several French restaurants, including one in Washington, D.C., that uh, advertised they were refusing to serve French wine until France did something about the heroin problem. Uh, the Daily News in New York was running a, a daily tally of overdose deaths, et cetera, uh, much like they had done during the Vietnam War. And so um, it, there was a good deal of pressure on, on France to do something. And so when uh, President Pompidou came to the White House to visit President Nixon, uh, he, he was not prepared to, uh, to, to, to have the president basically uh, place upon him this tremendous responsibility of getting his country out of the heroin business that was damaging the United States so, so much. Um, and I, again, I was, I was in Paris at the time, but I was working with the police. And I recall very, very clearly that when uh, President Pompidou returned from his visit to the White House, uh, the message came down through the Department or Ministry of Interior to the police that they had to step up their operations and they had to really get serious about the uh, heroin labs in, uh, in, in southern France. And uh, my, my colleagues, the, the, the police officers that I worked with on a daily basis, told me, we don't know what your president said to our president, but whatever it was, he's lit a fire under us, and we've got to go to work now and close these places down. And that precipitated a lot of um, uh, initiatives uh, between the French and the Americans. And of course, uh, 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 Mr. Krogh from the White House came over and uh, that was the beginning of a project that was called the Franco-American Committee. I believe it eventually became known as the Franco-American Commission. But it was started as a committee. And basically what it was was a sort of a bilateral agreement between France and the United States to not just share information about drug cases or drug matters, but to allow the officers of the French police to open an office in New York, for example, which they did and to allow the BNDD officers such as myself in Paris and uh, the ones we had in Marseille uh, to work uh, jointly with the French police doing things that were, um, let us say, a little bit out of the normal course of events in, uh, in French policing. Uh, for example, in the United States, we in BNDD very often used uh, techniques like undercover buys, uh, using informants. Uh, the nature of the narcotics crime was one where you never had an, a, a complainant as you might have in a property crime or a personal crime. And so you had to have a way of getting into these organizations. And a very, very effective way was using informants to, to give you the information about what was going on and wiretaps and things like this. Um, <clears throat> in France, by, uh, they had under the Napoleonic Code law system in France, which actually was in most of Europe, uh, informants were not allowed, at least not allowed to participate in the cases as they were in the U.S. Uh, they couldn't pay them, for example, for their information. Um, and uh, uh, undercover buys were completely out of the picture because that would be a, uh, a, a, com a crime in itself to, to actually precipitate a buy. And so these techniques that were very common in the United States and very effective were unknown in France. But the French police had a great interest in this. And so this um, Franco-American committee that was set up by Mr. Krogh and his assistants um, was very effective in creating uh, an atmosphere in which there could be cross-training. For example, rather than we Americans telling the French you don't know what you're doing or the French telling we Americans you don't know what you're doing in our country, uh, we could actually have training sessions, formal training sessions at the police academy in which we would explain the legal basis for how we work and how best to work. And the French learned a great deal from us, and we learned a great deal from them on all of this. We're, we're almost, almost, <clears throat> almost exporting our law enforcement approach to a completely different culture. Right. Who, they have a common interest in stopping this, but they don't use our ways. Precisely. And, and um, this committee that I talked about had um, uh, two levels. One was an executive committee level, which was made up of the principals, Minister of Interior for France, uh, a man by the name of Raymond Marcelin, who spoke flawless English. And 
really uh, liked, I think, uh, our country, our president, and our people. And uh, of course, John Mitchell, who was Mr. Nixon's, uh, President Nixon's attorney general. And so they got along very, very well. They signed the agreements, and, uh, and, and the formal group would meet uh, once or twice a year, once in France and once in the United States, once back in France and in the United States. They would meet to discuss bilateral issues that were given to them by the working group. We were part of the working group because we were the police. And so we knew, for example, that if, uh, if there were any obstacles in our relationships, they would be communicated up to the principals and that we, neither one of us, neither one of the working groups, whether it was the French police or the BNDD agents, wanted to give our bosses a problem that they would have to resolve at the executive level. And so we made sure that we worked together very well so that everything was looking well at the top. So it was, it was, it was a brilliant plan and project. So what, what you have, uh, I think fairly, is in the first year of the Nixon administration, you have more uh, direct involvement and photographic evidence of law enforcement. I mean, he alludes to treatment, but treatment's not leading in the first year. But watch, watch as we go through this panel. Watch how this changes. This is, this is why we do these panels, because this stuff is fascinating. Well, well, well I want to talk about that first year. You're, sure. No, you're, go, go you're, going, you're going on past that now. I am. So I want to go back to this and, and what happened. Uh, President Nixon, or, or Richard Nixon, ran uh, on a campaign of law and order. Drugs was part of that in terms of the social disruption that was going on in 1968. But drugs during that campaign meant LSD and marijuana. It did not mean heroin. Uh, and it had to do with the social chaos that was associated with the drug problem during that campaign. Then when Nixon ran against uh, the crime, he called Washington the crime capital of the nation. And he focused on crime in Washington, D.C. as an example of disorder uh, in the country that he was going to take care of. When he came in, he had an agenda, lots of things on his mind. Washington, D.C. was not the highest on his priority, but a group of leaders in Washington, D.C., business people, including Catherine Graham and Edward Bennett Williams and bank leaders, met with Nixon and said, you ran about this being the crime capital of the country. You are accountable for crime in this city starting January 20th, 1969. And we are going to hold a press conference every single month about crime in Washington. And it is now your problem to do something about that. That refocused Nixon on Washington, DC, and what can be done about the crime problem. He then, and just to talk to get the, the, the sequence of this uh, clear about what happened, uh, that started an interest in things like my, what I was doing in corrections. But the question was, what is causing crime in Washington? Why is it going up? Lyndon Johnson had established the DC Crime Commission. He had a national crime commission. The crime problem wasn't invented by Nixon. It was real, it was serious. But what was causing it? Why was it going up? Uh, this was a time of prosperity. Uh, the economy is going very well. Unemployment was down in the District of Columbia at that time. And that was where I got into the picture. Because in the summer of 1969, working in the Department of Corrections, I did drug testing of everybody coming into the DC jail. And I identified that 44% of the people coming in were heroin addicts. And then I asked the question, what year did you first start using heroin? And I put a graph together of when that was and with the DC crime rate, and they tracked perfectly. That was the moment. That was widely reported right away. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a year later, but it was reported immediately. Uh, and what it did was refocus the attention on the drugs, but this time on heroin, not on LSD and marijuana, and on crime. And that became an entirely different way of thinking about it. And this was Nixon's priority. He had started with a major increase in the police force. But then the question was, what do you do about the heroin problem? That's when I got interested in drug treatment and did like Jeff Donfeld did, went around and met people who were doing things, including Vincent Dole and Marie Neiswinder in New York and Jerry Jaffe in Chicago. Uh, and I said, we have to have a drug treatment program in Washington, D.C. And on September 15, 1969, the first methadone program in Washington started in the Department of Corrections 
uh, with me as the leader of that. Okay, now but, let's stop. Let's well, wait, no, just go one more okay. step. On February 17th, 1970, Walter Washington, building on that uh, beginning, created the Narcotics Treatment Administration in Washington, a massive methadone program in Washington that in the next three years treated 15,000 heroin addicts in the city. Uh, that was unprecedented uh, that went on. And every month there was a, a report on crime rates. And consistently, those crime rates came down along with the overdose deaths. We'll talk some more about that. But I want to get that, the timing of that very important and that switching of the focus. And s suddenly, the emergence of treatment as a very important part of not just reducing overdose deaths, which is very clear was a purpose, but also reducing crime. I want to make the point that this is going on below the surface of uh, national coverage and what we would say White House concerns. Here's Bob DuPont, <coughs> idealistic young doctor out of Harvard Medical School, who's beginning to make the case that treatment of heroin addicts reduces crime. But he's leading, and we don't even know who he is. He's dealing with a local problem. Big, I mean, it's important it's in Washington, D.C., but that kind of innovation isn't being driven by the White House. Now, no, we'll but, but, but Bud Crow we, called. Okay, we paused because we, now, connect your work to the White House. Oh, well, but, but, well, first of all, Walter Washington reported to, to Bud Crow. Let's start with that. So whatever was going on in Washington was on Bud Crow's agenda, absolutely, from the beginning. And the, I can't impress on you enough how what we were doing was front page news in Washington, D.C., day after day after day. There was incredible focus on the crime issue and the, and the methadone program by September uh, of, of 1970. Uh, we had a, uh, an expose uh, on the CBS television station, an hour long, talking about how I was a liar and a fraud and methadone was poisoning the city. It was an amazing, I'm a young guy, I just started this thing, and now I'm a, suddenly I've got an hour long primetime documentary against, about, you. against me. In your enemy of the people. The enemy of the people. And racial issues were involved in this. It was very difficult. But what happened at that point was very striking, and that is both of the newspapers, the Washington Post and the Evening Star, put their top people on this question of what was going on, uh, this television report. And both of them came out. The, the, the editor of the uh, editorial page of the Washington Post said he had to go to Catherine Graham because she owned the television station that was attacking me. And he was going to come out with it. So both papers came out with lead editorials. DuPont is right. Methadone is the answer. The television program is wrong. And that was a extremely important, and I can't tell you how big it was in terms of the controversies that was going on. It was not something going on under the radar. And early on, Bud Krogh wanted to talk to me. Uh, and my first visit to the West Wing, it was very uh, exciting. Met people like you two guys. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was very interesting. He was very interested in this. And Walter Washington, the mayor, uh, was t deeply involved in what we were doing. When I would get into trouble on racial issues, for example, on methadone, I would get discouraged. And I would go to the mayor and I'd say, this is too hard for me. And he said, no, the people of this city love you. You're doing the right thing. You're helping us. If you don't show up here often enough, I'm worried you're getting another job or you're sick. So keep going. Okay. Uh, again, okay. that was very okay. visible. Jeff, do you have something to add? I, I do. I want to clarify something that you said, Jeff. Um, you, you, I think you said um, treatment, um, heroin treatment, had an effect on crime. You got to be more specific. It was really methadone treatment, exactly, that had an impact on crime reduction. Not just crime reduction, but the unemployment oh. of people in methadone uh, did not. It stayed up. Uh, the criminal recidivism was reduced. And, and that was uh, my findings when I w went around the country to compare the difference between methadone maintenance in the therapeutic communities. Um, it, an important comment that Bob is, is making, um, the country, at least in, in uh, I'll say the black community, a lot of the black community, 
felt that the administration's um, advocacy of methadone maintenance was an effort to, quote, subjugate the black community. Uh, there was nothing further from the truth than that statement. As a result of methadone maintenance, uh, we not only reduced uh, the death rate among heroin addicts, but we gave them an opportunity to have productive lives. Um, and so uh, there was um, a perception, especially in the therapeutic psychiatric community, that we were pushing um, an alternative addiction, which we were. Methadone is certainly addictive, um, but it had beneficial effects. Okay. I, I know what the next slide is. You do. And I want to get to that slide. Go ahead. Where we can really dwell on methadone. And you're front running my slides. I apologize. So it, it, it's all right. You, you can catch up in a minute. This is, this is just a campaign event in uh, Denver. Uh, they have the date, and I can't read the dates. 1970. Uh, and this is, he's with law enforcement people. But this is the first time we see the words methadone maintenance appear uh, from the president's remarks. So we've, we've now, and, and, and we're, I mean, I grant you Bob is doing good work, and, and it's coming to the attention of the White House, and Jeff is devoting full time and attention to treatment, but this is, this is percolated up to the president himself. This is a law enforcement show. There's a White House conference, uh, and it's a sniffing dog. And you were talking earlier about what we were doing with these conferences. Yes. Um, we were trying to get uh, the media, television, uh, movie producers, uh, radio disc jockeys, to inject anti-drug abuse um, messages into their programming. And so one of the things we did was we brought these folks to Washington. We had uh, Bureau of Customs put on this kind of demonstration with the um, heroin sniffing dogs. Uh, we had programs in the White House Theater where we had ex-addicts act out what happens in the therapeutic community. So we were really, I'll, I'll call it a multi-modality approach to, to try to um, infuse into the culture of America a notion that drugs was not really cool. And this particular picture has Gene Autry standing to the <laughs> president's left. What, and this is on the South Lawn. So then we get to an undated memo from the Ash Council. The Ash Council uh, was uh, uh, created by President Nixon to comment on government structure and how structure uh, uh, affected the efficiency of the government. And, and uh, unfortunately, this particular memo is undated, so we don't know for sure when it came in. But it's describing the difficulty that uh, they uncovered with the spread of drug abuse enforcement and treatment in all these different agencies because drugs is a growing, growingly recognized problem. There's money available. So every agency says, wow, we can get a bigger budget if we get involved in the drug abuse effort. And, and it, it, what you get is too big a spread of effort and authority. And that's all the Ash Council recognized in this memo. Then we have the uh, uh, Narcotics Treatment and Control Act of 1970. And this is President Nixon signing the bill uh, in, at the Department of Justice, but in the office of John Ingersoll, who's the head of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. This is not a giant press event. He knew how to do giant press events. This particular event, he signed it in front of the law enforcement officers, the BNDD officers. So it's, it's uh, a different kind of leadership. It's not just the public leadership. It's encouraging the troops. And then uh, this is the statement that he made uh, uh, at that signing. And I highlighted at the bottom uh, in yellow, again, Treatment is still there. He's saying, and we, we can't abandon these people. We've got to do something on treatment. And, and the language is unique here because he's predicting that we're going to come up with better treatment. We're working very, very hard 
at trying to develop more efficient treatment. And I, I think you could say, I mean, I'm looking for it, but you could say he's anticipating methadone as becoming the treatment of choice for, uh, for heroin addiction. Uh, we're going to go back to John uh, here. This is President Nixon in Paris attending Charles de, Charles de Gaulle's funeral. John, you were there. Yeah, I was there, and uh, I remember that day very well because uh, all the law enforcement officers assigned to the embassy in Paris, which would be the ATF, the FBI, the BNDD, uh, Secret Service, and some of the Army CID, Criminal Investigation Division officers, um, they were all uh, put on duty, actually, to supplement the uh, protection detail for the president when he visited Notre Dame for the funeral service of uh, President de Gaulle. And uh, we were in the church uh, for that particular service that day. And uh, I remember the president, and he, he was very well received by uh, a number of uh, dignitaries that attended the uh, service, as well as by uh, President Pompidou. Now, I will tell you when we do these forms, we work very hard to get the members of the panel in a picture with the President of the United States. I mean, that, that's, that's the way these things work. One of the difficulties is when you're on the President's staff, one of your requirements is you stay out of the pictures. You, know, you bring in the people the President wants to meet with or be seen with, and the staff is supposed mm -hmm. to be off camera. So with John, who spent 33 years doing drug abuse law enforcement, we don't have a picture of John with President Nixon, but they were both at the same event. So this is close. We go to church together. That's right. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay, here we go. This is uh, President Nixon and the King. And there are fun stories about this. When we told David Ferriero, the uh, archivist, that the panel today was on drug abuse, his first question was, are you going to include the picture with Elvis Presley? And as you may know, this is the single most popular picture owned by the National Archives. It's not the Constitution, it's not the Bill of Rights, it's Elvis Presley and President Nixon, two uh, uh, somewhat different personalities. Uh, <laughs> Jeff and I were there on the day, it, we tell our grandkids, but I'll let Jeff tell it first. One day, sitting in my office in the old executive office building, I received a call from Bud Krogh, whose office was literally across the hall from mine. And Bud said, uh, the king is here. I said, what? He said, the king is here. I said, Bud, I'm really busy. What, what do you want? He said, Elvis Presley is at the north gate of the White House, and he wants to see the president. I said, you've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you come over to my office, we've got to prepare talking points for the president. Before uh, the staff would bring in someone to visit uh, the president in the Oval Office, staff would prepare talking points. Here's what we suggest that you say. And the thrust of what we wanted President Nixon to say to Elvis is to try to get Elvis involved again in, um, in some anti-drug abuse comments. So I'm, uh, we, we prepare the remarks. Um, Elvis is invited into the Oval Office, and he was bringing with him a silver-plated 45 automatic that he wanted to give the president. Commemorative <laughs> pistol. Uh, the Beautiful box. The, the Secret Service immediately confiscated the, uh, <laughs> the, the weapon. Uh, I was sitting with uh, Elvis's two bodyguards in my office while Elvis uh, went into the Oval Office, and the bodyguard said, uh, we want to go into uh, the Oval Office with uh, Elvis. I said, you can't do that. He said, well, there will be a call for us to come over. I said, well, when the call comes, you know, I'll, I'll escort you over. Meantime, the phone rings, and it's um, Bud Krogh, and he says, Jeff, get a BNDD badge. Um, Elvis wants a badge. I said, what? He said, yep, call over to Jack Ingersoll and get a badge. Okay. I called Jack Ingersoll, the director of Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and I said, uh, Jack, I need a BNDD badge. He said, what for? I said, uh, the president wants to give one to Elvis Presley. And the response was, no can do. I said, what do you mean, no can do? He said, well, Elvis hasn't gone through the training program. 
I said, Jack, you probably don't understand this. The leader of the Western world wants to give Elvis Presley <laughs> a BND badge. Get me an expletive badge over to the White House right away. Yes, sir. <laughs> and that, that, that's how that happened. Elvis never got involved in helping us with any uh, anti-drug abuse messages. Very disappointing. So, and, okay. and let me add this. Okay. You know, because we were s such squares at the White House, we had no understanding of Elvis's involvement with drugs. No. Right, right. Nobody knew. It, uh, uh, it's a slightly different take because we were, we were both there. Uh, Elvis wants to come see the president to tell the president that he's really for law and order and that in his own way, he's discouraging drug use uh, amongst his uh, uh, fan base. And he can't come out and say, look, kids, don't, don't use drugs, because that will detract from the sales of records. Uh, but he wants the president to know that he's trying in his own way. And he collects badges, you know, and that's why he wants a BNDD badge. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, toward the end. I mean, Elvis had an interesting career. And when he wasn't on tour, he'd eat. Uh, uh, his, his favorite dish was fried bananas and honey, I think. Uh, uh, and he'd gain a lot of weight. And then he'd have to shed the weight to go on tour. And it got harder and harder. So he'd use amphet amphetamines. And, and he'd get doctor's prescriptions. And it was, what comes to light later is it was drug abuse. But he wouldn't have described it that way. He would have said, no, I'm trying to, I'm trying to trim down. You can see he's a little, he's a little heavy. Uh, when he came, this is Elvis. You know, you're a little careful. Nixon and Elvis are not <laughs> out of the same mold. And one of our jobs was to hold Elvis for an hour to make sure things were calm enough to take him over to the Oval Office. There was a big debate about whether this was an astute uh, audience to grant this audience. Elvis just showed up at the Northwest Gate, you know, I, I'd like to see the president. You don't do that. So Bud and Jeff and I were making nice with Elvis for an hour to, before we gave the signal because we're in the old executive office building, the West Wing is across the street, before we gave the signal that we thought it was okay, that it was, you know, he wasn't uh, going to say something rabid. But Elvis is dressed, you know, like the king. He's sweeping up and down the hallway of the old executive office building, going into offices and embracing the secretaries, and they're having an absolute ball. You know, I mean, this is... Everything stopped. Elvis is in the building. <laughs> Everything stopped. And it was, it was, it was a glorious day. And, and, and it's, you know, it's the most popular picture for a reason. About 15 years later, I took my son down to Washington uh, uh, trying to convince him how great his father once was. And we were going to go in and see a friend who was uh, uh, back as a member of the White House staff. So we're at the Northwest Gate to go in. My son is too young to have a driver's license, so he doesn't have ID. And I've been cleared, and he's cleared with a wrong first name. So there's a kid who wants to come in with me to go into the West Wing. Uh, and the guard isn't quite sure what to do because it's the wrong name. And so he calls over his supervisor. And his supervisor says, I think it will be okay. I remember Mr. Shepard when he was on the White House staff. I was there for five years, but you know, I remember when Mr. Shepard was on the White House staff. In fact, he was here the day Elvis came. <laughs> and my kid's eyes like, you know, that was the most important thing to him the whole trip. You know, that Elvis, and to this day, if you were involved in the Elvis visit, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's significant. Historic. And, uh, uh, and he meant well. You, 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 not to, he's a great singer. He he was uh, he was an aw shucks kind of guy. If he was off the stage, I mean it was a, it, it was madam and sir and and uh, uh, 
It was just an interesting guy. In any event, we were there. This is why I shut these people off. This is the key meeting. Uh, uh, if, you, if you're looking for origins, if you're going back through the documents and you're looking for origins of a change in policy, it's something like seeking out the source of the Nile. You, know, you keep going back up to the smallest creek. Where does it start? This picture, and what went on a little bit before and a little bit after, is key to understanding the dramatic change in drug treatment. And we let Jeff go without my interruption for a little bit here, because he has a heck of a story to tell. As I mentioned earlier, um, I went around the country uh, trying to identify the best that America had to offer in terms of treatment and people. And all fingers um, pointed in the direction of Dr. Jerome Jaffe. Uh, within the um, therapeutic community, uh, there was always criticism uh, pointing out deficiencies in either, either the individuals or the program of various treatment programs. However, no one criticized Dr. Jaffe. As a result of um, his respect in the uh, treatment community, I asked Dr. Jaffe to form a group of outside experts, non-government folks, to put together a paper uh, of recommendations for what the federal government should do in the way of treatment, education, rehabilitation, epidemiology. Uh, at first, um, many of the folks approached were reluctant because uh, people in the therapeutic communities didn't trust Richard Nixon. The irony of all this is that here in the Oval Office, Dr. Jerome Jaffe, a Jewish Democrat, is appointed really America's first drug czar. And uh, Jerry then selected a man named Paul wait, Perito. Wait, wait, wait. Let's go backwards. I, I know the stories you should be telling. Before you got to the Oval Office, you faced down cabinet officers a little bit before this. OK, thank you. You said you weren't going to interrupt, but uh, I was, I was <laughs> This is a good interruption. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I put together, before this meeting, I, I had put together a paper, uh, a memo to Bud Krogh, in which I analyzed uh, the various treatment programs that I had visited around the country and came up with recommendations for the United States to adopt methadone maintenance as, as a legitimate uh, treatment modality. Uh, following that memo, I was called into John Ehrlichman's office. Uh, participating in that meeting was John Mitchell, the Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, who was then um, Secretary of HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare, Jack Ingersoll, uh, Director of Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, Dr. Bertram Brown, the uh, Director of the National Institute of, of Mental Health, uh, Ehrlichman and Krogh. Um, I was the only one advocating methadone maintenance. I had done my homework. I had the statistics. Uh, and the other gentlemen were either silent or opposed. Certainly, Dr. Brown was opposed to it because that was a threat of funding uh, and really criticism of the psychiatric community. Um, Jack Ingersoll, perhaps John Mitchell were opposed because it was uh, introducing into America on a wide scale basis if the program were Im implemented in, in, a, in a an addictive, addictive in drug. Addictive drug. Yeah. Um, Ehrlichman uh, sat in and listened and ultimately led to a recommendation to the president that the United States adopt methadone maintenance. Okay, let's pause. Let's pause for a second. Let's go through, with Bob's help, what the alternative treatments were and how methadone actually worked. Okay, Bob? You're yeah, the, the, uh, the, 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 there had been an earlier uh, episode of heroin addiction uh, that focused in California and New York and in both of those states, they had developed a uh, substantial civil commitment program uh, for heroin addicts. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, as governor of New York, uh, embraced, the therapy, em embraced the civil commitment uh, approach to the problem. Uh, separate from that, 
uh, growing out of a, the program was called Synanon in California, but came across the Mississippi as Daytop uh, and Phoenix House uh, and Odyssey House, which were therapeutic communities in New York City, was an alternative uh, treatment program that involved a year or two or three years of residential care of, of heroin addicts uh, to change their character and send them out uh, into the community as, as reformed. And that was the approach uh, uh, John Lindsay, the mayor of New York, picked for what was going on uh, with that. So that were, those were the two sort of polar ideas. Uh, what, what happened was Vincent Dole started in the 1960s this methadone program, which involved uh, giving the person an oral dose of methadone once a day. Heroin addicts have to inject the drug four or five times a day, and it's very unstable. But methadone, because it's orally effective and longer lasting, uh, you can use once a day dose. And what Dole found was that people could be stabilized. And with the use of methadone, it prevented them having overdoses. And it, it, it stopped the euphoric effect of injecting a heroin while they were taking it because of the, quote, blockade of the methadone. Okay, and people were able to, to go about uh, functioning uh, well. Uh, but there was tremendous controversy about the methadone, and you can hear it here uh, in this presentation. Uh, and the, the genius, among the genius moves of Jerome Jaffe, uh, was to package the methadone in what he called a multimodality program. In other words, it wasn't just methadone. We're talking as if the, what the government did was just methadone. It never was that. It was methadone plus. And so it included these other elements, including uh, civil commitment, which was the NARA Act under the federal law. So it was a package that was a multimodality package, but the dominant form of treatment and the, the, the uh, driver of it uh, was methadone. If you look at, at both the ther therapeutic community and civil commitment, they were unscalable to the size of the problem. Uh, you couldn't mobilize a response like that in the district where there are 15,000 addicts we treated. You couldn't have done it with either, either therapeutic communities or uh, civil commitment. Uh, there just wasn't enough ability to do that. But methadone, you could okay. scale it. Okay, let's stop. Stop for just a second. I'm going to summarize this because I'm on the outside. Uh, uh, methadone is addictive. It's yes. a synthetic. It's got nothing to do with opium. Correct. Right. You take it orally, you take it once a day, they, they put it with orange juice, uh, uh, you don't get a high because it's going through the system, and, and it, but it blocks the craving for heroin. Yes. So you become functional but a, a, addicted to a drug that doesn't give you a high. Okay, I wouldn't use the word addicted. I would use okay. physically dependent. Physically dependent. It's a better Fun. word. Just happy to do that. And so what this young, inexperienced lawyer who's working nonstop on treatment, he's gone around and he's seen in our great country several examples of where methadone is working. <clears throat> and he comes back and he does a paper and he says, this is the future. And he goes and he faces down. Now, John Ehrlichman is Bud Krogh's boss, so he's got... He's got some weight on his side. He faces down all the powers that be that have been relying on civil commitment and therapeutic communities and the money that comes with that. And this young, aggressive White House staffer uh, wins. It's the picture before this, but we don't have the picture with John Ehrlichman's office and the cabinet secretaries. But Jeff prevails. And then he takes... Jaffe as the, 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 the guy with the, with the answer in to see the president. Okay? Now I'm going to go to the next picture unless you have more to add on this one. This is pitching the president in private. And this is uh, uh, John Ehrlichman, Bob Haldeman, Jeff, Bud I, Krogh. I had and, hair there so you don't recognize me. Yeah, it's true. You do have hair there. Uh, and uh, Arnie Weber with his back to the camera. You never want your back to the camera. It's a, it's a bad... Bad place to be. But then one week later, we go public. And probably this whole development from your paper to the meeting in Ehrlichman's office to the meeting in the Oval Office to going public is a month? Probably. Okay. You think the government can't act when it wants to? 
Well, there, there's even a better story than that in terms of government acting quickly. You know, there was a, the confluence of the concern among the American people with regard to the relationship of heroin addiction <clears throat> and the commission of crime and the war in Vietnam. We're coming. We have a slide. We're coming I'm to that. jumping ahead again, huh? You are. Okay. You know, you can't I anticipate. I apologize. It's okay. Well, you have a good story, but not this story. So here we are, and there's two or three of these slides. This is the president's message on June 17th, 1971, where he says, I want to create the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention, SEODAP. I want Congress to enact it, but I'm going to create it by executive order, and I'm going to appoint Jerry Jaffe to run it. And Jeff's done all the staffing on this. He, of course, isn't in the picture. He's not quite senior enough to be in the picture. This is uh, Bud Krogan and John Ehrlichman. But Jeff's done all the work. So there's a public announcement of this presidential endorsement and organization designed to encourage a treatment based on methadone maintenance. Jeff, it's more than that. <clears throat> SEODEP was designed to focus within the federal government all non-law enforcement, treatment, education, rehabilitation. Research. Uh, research. Re re research. <clears throat> Before SEODEP, there were 14 different federal agencies. Each had their own domain. There was no consensus. There was no vision. There was no uh, uniform concept as to what we were trying to achieve. The concept of SEODEP was that centralized program and budgetary authority within the executive office of the president so that we would have clout to give direction to the federal government's approach to the drug problem. Two issues here. We don't want you to miss this. This is terribly important. Uh, treatment comes to the fore. You could say radical new treatment. It's tried, but this is putting the full effort of the President of the United States behind this treatment modality, bringing into the executive office of the president the authority to do this. This is not an HEW is going to do it. And it's, it's, it's an interesting design. It's going to be in for three or four years. And then it's going to go back out to the National Institute of Health. But it's bringing it in to get it right to be sure the bureaucracy <clears throat> follows the presidential leadership. And as we said when we were rehearsing, you can tell we didn't rehearse very well, but when we were rehearsing this, seldom in uh, government policy changes can you point to the exact moment when the decision was made. But this is that, I mean, over a course of a month, but this is that moment on treatment. I think the other interesting aspect of SEODAP, at least the legislation that finally went to Congress and was unanimously passed by Congress, was the idea of a sunset clause. We decided that if we didn't accomplish our goal within three or four years, we ought to disintegrate. We didn't want to create another perpetual bureaucracy. And I think that was another unique aspect of the Nixon administration not wanting to expand the federal bureaucracy. So. The Jerry Jaffe is the first drug czar, but he's temporary. Yes. Okay. Now we get to go to Vietnam. It's a color picture. It was worth the wait. <laughs> okay. Um, shortly after that meeting in the Oval Office, Jerry Jaffe and I are told to go to the Pentagon to talk to the Pentagon about um, the drug, the heroin addiction problem in Vietnam. So Jerry and I, just the two of us, go over the Pentagon. We meet in a very large conference room with generals and admirals. And Jerry says, you know, you, you folks have a problem in Vietnam with heroin addiction. Um, the, the, uh, the military was not very forthcoming in conceding that there was a problem. And Jerry said, well, you know, the, the president thinks there's a problem. We've got to do something about it. Well, what would you like to do, Dr. Jaffe? Well, I think we have to identify the problem. We have to uh, determine how many soldiers are, in fact, addicted to heroin. Uh, this comes right after two congressmen return from a trip to Vietnam, and they claim that 10 to 15% of our soldiers are addicted to heroin. 
So Jerry says, well, we could uh, do urine analysis uh, to determine what the incidence of heroin addiction is in, in Vietnam. And the generals say, well, there really isn't the technology to, to um, assay uh, urine samples in, in any short period of time. And Jerry says, well, what if there's a machine that can analyze a urine sample in 30 seconds? Well, the generals and admirals said, it doesn't exist. Jerry said, do you have a speakerphone in this conference room? Well, yes, sir, we do. Can I make a phone call? Jerry calls some folks that he knew in um, Palo Alto and said, um, could you, exp I'm in a conference room at the Pentagon, could you explain the free, uh, the frat, free radical assay technique, the machines that you've developed? Long story short, there were two machines that had been developed that could um, do a urine, urine sample in 30 seconds. So the deal that Jerry made with the Pentagon was, if I can find these machines, will you fly them over to Vietnam? Two machines in two, the entire United States. Two machines in the entire, yes sir, we can do that. So these uh, scientists in uh, Palo Alto say, yep, we've got the machines. The machines were put on Air Force jets in, uh, at Moffett Air Force Base on the West Coast. Uh, Jerry and I and Dr. Benny Prim of New York uh, flew over to Vietnam to watch the machines in operation. I was flown out to a fire base to observe soldiers urinating into bottles um, to see how the system worked. And when we came back from <coughs> Vietnam, um, we came to the Western White House uh, to brief the president. I did not, I'm not in that picture because I wanted to go see my parents in Los Angeles. You can see how years later these, uh, these parental respect visits come home to roost. <laughs> so you have Benny Prim, John Ehrlichman, President Nixon, Jerry Jaffe, and Bud Krogh, and Jeff should have been there, he did all the work, uh, coming back from Vietnam, reporting on the installation of these two machines. And, and just to put it, because we're, we're getting short on time, to no. put it into context, the accusation was these returning soldiers, because Nixon's drawing down, there were 537,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam when Nixon took office, and he's drawing them down. And the accusation was these are heroin addicts, killers, heroin addicts that you're returning to the United States and letting loose in society. And we've come up with a machine that shows if you're really addicted. And word gets out, you correct me if I'm wrong, but word gets out, if you skip use of drugs for three days, you will come out clean and you can go home. If you do not pass the test, you cannot go home. Right. <clears throat> we, the soldiers were told that uh, if they were not clean, they would stay in country for detoxification, uh, and then they would be sent to a VA or a Department of Defense uh, detox facility, perhaps in Southeast Asia. So we were creating an incentive to the, for the soldiers to stay off heroin. And <clears throat> out of 22,000 tests that were done at one point in time, the in incidence of heroin dependency was 4.5% versus what the two congressmen claimed to be 10 to 15%. After the incentive? After the incentive was instituted. Fantastic. And, and the rumor, the allegation of these heroin addicts being loosed on the United States went away. Correct. So we had a separate but significant victory but based on scientific uh, 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 testing. Yes. All right. So we're going to go to uh, law enforcement for a minute. Uh, this is President Nixon with Miles Ambrose. Miles Ambrose was the Commissioner of Customs, and SEODAP, the idea of bringing treatment into the Executive Office of the President, seems such a great idea that the next step was we brought law enforcement in to the Executive Office of the President through the creation of what was called ODALE, the Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement. And we took the Commissioner of Customs and made him in charge. And here he's taking President Nixon to the customs facilities at JFK, where a lot of the drugs are coming in. 
uh, and they're touring the uh, drug detention facilities at, at JFK. Uh, this is a, yet another meeting in the cabinet room. You know, the president uh, has a lot of these. This is the International Narcotics Control Cabinet Committee, and it's got uh, uh, the senior cabinet officers. And what's unique about this particular picture is they had recently seized a heroin lab. So if you look behind the president, uh, uh, where we would normally have some people seated, uh, there's a laboratory. And in front of each of the cabinet officers, uh, we have a glassine envelope that looks like a, 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 a pound of flour, and that's pure heroin. And we, we told, we, we, this is what we do here. We seize, we seize drugs, and then we distribute them in cabinet committee meetings. Uh, but the, the word was, don't touch the envelope, because you'll, you'll pick up some of the, the heroin dust. Uh, but it was a very impressive display for the cabinet officers. I think we can name some of them. Uh, if you go up the left side, it's John Connolly of uh, Treasury and then Dick Kleindienst, uh, who is now Attorney General, and across, President Nixon. Those are the assigned seats. And to Nixon's left is Mel Laird, the Secretary of Defense, and to Nixon's right is Bill Rogers, the Secretary of State. I, I, I can't name the other ones, but the way the cabinet room is set up, the four oldest departments flank the president, uh, state justice, treasury, and defense. On either side of him, vice president's directly across. And he's not in this picture, uh, but, but treasury and uh, justice are. So this is another example of the use of the president's time and the emphasis coming down from the president on the importance of combating narcotics, law enforcement, and treatment. This is back to your nickel. You treatment guys, you got half these slides. What is this? Uh, I think this is the. Is this the president signing the? Uh, yes, it the is. Act? Yeah. Yes, it is. So this is uh, March twenty first, nineteen seventy two. Congress passes the Drug Abuse Office and Treatment Act of nineteen seventy two, which led to uh, enormous increase in uh, the federal budget for drug programming. Um, I want to mention one of uh, Jerry Jaffe's mantras was that America should have a sufficient number of treatment slots within the country so that no addict can claim that he committed a crime because of his heroin dependency because he could not get adequate treatment. So that was one of our goals was to vastly increase uh, <clears throat> treatment opportunities throughout the United States. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is America really didn't have, and I'd like, I'd like Bob to talk to this, didn't have an adequate infrastructure of treatment folks, people that knew how to deal with the manipulative heroin addict. Uh, the therapeutic communities were very expensive to operate. The methadone maintenance uh, treatment programs were not that expensive, and Bob, I'd, I'd love for you to talk to the relative expenses. But uh, again, that was Jerry Jaffe's mantra, let's get treatment out into America. And this, in my view, created the compassionate balance between what was perceived as only the Nixon administration's focus on law enforcement balanced with compassionate treatment programs. But look at what this did for the law enforcement side. We're seizing importation. We are increasing the price of drugs because we're working really hard at interdiction. We're doing our dead level bus to end the availability of heroin. And at the same time, we're making treatment available for those people so they're not left in the lurch. You've got this uh, very, very happy balance at the time. Uh, between stronger law enforcement and wider availability of treatment. So this particular note, this is the president signing this bill. When you go back to Jerry Jaffe uh, in the press room, it, it, it's a, it, he's being named head of SEODAP created by executive order. This is the actual legislation, 
and you see the room's full because this legislation has passed the Congress without a single dissenting vote. Now, Nixon said off camera time and time again to his people, you know, the votes are for law enforcement. People don't want addicts roaming around on the streets. And, and, and that's what the const my constituency wants. But we can't do that to these addicts without supplying treatment. There aren't any votes for expanded treatment. But that's not how we're doing it. We're going down both paths at once. OK? But I, I, I'm concerned that we're about running out of time. Yes. And we got to draw some conclusions here. And well, I wanna, we've got, I, we've I, got the slide. Well, but I think we've got more than a slide uh, to talk about. I, I, I think it's a, to, I, I think I'm the only person who's known every White House drug czar, all 17 of them. But let me, we, let yeah. me, we've got two slides. I can get through them and we can get to the last all slide. All right, all right. Okay. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. All here. right, so here's, uh, here's Nixon meeting with uh, Treasury and uh, law enforcement people in the Oval Office talking about drugs yet again. Here's another meeting in the Cabinet Room. Uh, uh, yet again, if you, if you go through our, our chronology, Nixon's doing something at least every other month on drug abuse treatment or law enforcement. Here he goes down to Laredo, Texas, and he's talking uh, to the customs agents where the, the stuff has started to come in a, across the Mexican, uh, uh, Mexican border, and he's down, again, viewing law enforcement. Uh, these are two articles by Bob DuPont. We don't have time for you to read them, but Bob <laughs> has written at the time authored uh, very, very important articles, influential articles. This is Science Magazine, and this one he co-authors with James Q. Wilson. If you remember James Q. Wilson, he's the uh, author of the broken windows theory, that you've got to uh, get on crime and petty crime right away or it grows. And he co-authors a wonderful article, which uh, uh, we recommend to all of you with, with Bob DuPont, And this is another signature. Bob is in this. It's we've broken into color, color pictures. This is Nixon signing uh, two bills, uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, the, the uh, Narcotic Addict, Addict Treatment Act of 74 and the Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and uh, Rehabilitation Act of 74. And then this is the, we're going on the last three slides, so you can, you can hold still. Bob sponsored, organized and sponsored, a 35th anniversary reunion of the people who worked on the drug treatment side in the Nixon administration. And this is the morning panel. Uh, Jerry Jaffe's at the podium, and Bud Krogh and uh, Paul Perito, who is deputy, uh, are, are there. And they're talking about this dramatic change in treatment uh, and, and, and fighting drug abuse that had occurred under the Nixon administration. And then we have Bob himself, Bob himself uh, uh, addressing the second panel, but that's because we didn't get a picture of, of the panel. Uh, but it was so interesting because at this, at this reunion, we had people from HEW and people from the Department of Justice, and the guy at HEW I thought had the best, he said he'd been at a bureaucrat at HEW for 30 years, and never in his entire existence had he remembered a situation like what happened when the Nixon administration took leadership of drug abuse treatment. He said he was called in to a meeting in the secretary's office, the only time he saw the secretary, uh, and L.A. Richardson said, this is a presidential initiative, and the president is exercising leadership and I don't want to hear my department's not supporting. So if people from the White House call, I want to know that you jumped at their request. Which brings us to the last slide, and we're going to let Bob dwell on this. We have five whole minutes, okay? What are the lessons that we learned from President Nixon's drug abuse initiative? What, are the, what was done then that may be transferable, may be not transferable? Bob? Well, I want to go back a little bit. What was Nixon reacting to? Nixon was reacting to the modern drug abuse epidemic, a change in the world 
that went on in the late 1960s. It was not like anything that happened before. People will tell you, well, drugs have been around a long time. Nothing before it happened like what happened in the 60s with the drug abuse epidemic. Marijuana was part of that, psychedelics, heroin. There was a huge, phenomenal change in what was going on. And the Nixon administration was right there when that happened. And what happened was very dramatic because Nixon grabbed a hold of that issue and created the foundation for everything that's happened since uh, in terms of dealing with the drug problem. And I think that's really important. And he, he made it a, a signature part of his administration. Uh, this, this first uh, 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 bullet there, he said this is top priority. We have to pay attention to this. We have to get this right. Uh, here, and that was a very big deal. Uh, he created this, the wh first White House Drug Office. There has been a White House Drug Office ever since, and there is to this day, 47 years later, a White House Drug Office. There is no other issue that has had a White House office over that period of time. That tells you something about the gravity of the issue and the, uh, the importance uh, of that issue. He created the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, which is the premier research institution for, for drugs for the entire world. Maybe 80% of drug research in the world is through NIDA. Uh, its budget is now $1.25 billion just in drug research going on. That started in 1973. Uh, Nixon started that. He started DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, which is the focus of, of what's going on. That is really important uh, to, to understand that. And, and I go crazy when people say drug policy is a, is a war between law enforcement and treatment. What do you believe in? And Nixon is credited with saying it's a war on drugs. Nixon is just law enforcement. He, wrong. I'm a doctor. I'm going to tell you that the law enforcement is a public health strategy to deal with the drug epidemic. Treatment needs law enforcement. Prevention needs law enforcement. It's co commonplace to say we can't arrest our way out of the drug epidemic right, but we can't treat our way out of the drug epidemic either. We need to have them working together, and that was the signature of Nixon. Was Before Nixon, it was just law enforcement. Nixon focused on laws more. We've done that. But he built and created the, the uh, health, uh, the research, the prevention, the treatment side of that as co-equal, of working together. That happened during those precious years. And one of the things that, that Jeff hasn't said, but I want to put it in words, is that, that there was a, a moment, there was a, a, a magic moment uh, in history. Uh, with the Nixon administration, with a lot of young people. Uh, and this was in the, true in the district government. It was true in the federal government that had a lot of ideas and were given authority to do things, to make things happen. And they did just what uh, uh, Jeff was talking about, learning from what's going on, not just going back, well, what have we been doing? I want to do more of that. No. Uh, Jeff went around and looked, what's the best new thing to do? How do you do that? How do we make that national po policy? That was the Fair attitude that was happening. Fair enough. And that credit you're giving to Jeff is not to me. It's to that Jeff. Well, both of you. I think, I think okay. you were. We're, there were a we're, group of people, though. We're at and the end of our time. We're at the end of our time. But the last slide says, look, here's what we did. Number one priority, accountability, bipartisan basis, innovation, committed leadership. I mean, we've demonstrated it's just time and time and time. It's not a single speech by President Nixon. It's heavy involvement. We grant you that today may be different because it's a different kind of problem. It's in a diff different communities. But lots of these things, lots of these things are transferable. We appreciate your coming. We appreciate your participating in the forum. And, and uh, we hope that at some point you'll come on uh, the website and look at the documents that accompany this panel. Thank you very much.